Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're joining all of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary and joining us on live stream. We're glad that you're here today to open God's word and to share in singing and worship of him today. Let's have a word of prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you give us wisdom, strength, and direction. But, Father, also that spirit that you use to bless those around us. Lord, we thank you for friends, for fellow believers who come alongside us in moments and remind us of your presence and of your love. Lord, in this hour of worship today, we pray that your name be praised, that all glory be given to you, and that our hearts are filled by the power of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. stand together and begin our worship with Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
be seated, please. All right. Good morning. I'm so excited to see you guys and to have this time with you kids. This time is especially for you, so be sure you listen up. I have next to me here a globe, and you might wonder, why does Miss Abby have a globe? Well, I have a globe because it has to do with our mission for life. So in life, we all have a mission, whether we're kids or adults. If we're kids, our mission might include going to school or helping around at home, being a brother or a sister or a friend. Adults, our mission might include a job where we're an employee or a boss or we're a mom or a dad or we're a friend or we're a sibling. We all have a job and a mission, and we have these people in life that walk alongside of us in that mission. But we have a mission that goes beyond our everyday life that we live here on earth. We have a mission that is given to us by Jesus. But we don't only have a mission given to us by Jesus. We have a companion that's promised to us by Jesus. Today our scripture reading is going to come from Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to have that here in a few minutes. But we're going to kind of walk through what that means and what it says. So after Jesus was raised from the dead, he spent 40 days with his disciples where he talked to them and he told them about what was to come in the kingdom of God. And after this, Jesus, he went to his disciples and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now this means that Jesus is like super in charge. He's the big boss of, of, of everything over all of creation. He's the king over all of creation. And he's the person that God has chosen to rule his kingdom. So Jesus, he gave the disciples and everyone a job, a mission. He said, therefore go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples from people of of every nation. Now that word disciple means follower or learner. These disciples, they were given this, this command to go and tell people all over the world about who Jesus is and what he had come to do. And when people would believe, they would become disciples too. But then he told them to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this baptism was an outward sign of what Jesus had done to their heart, that they had chosen to no longer live for themselves, but to live according to God's word. And he continued on saying, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded. Everything changes whenever we believe in who Jesus is. We don't live for ourselves anymore. We're living according to the word of God. And Jesus said this, remember, I am with you always until the very end of the age. And that's my favorite part, I think, that Jesus is with us until the very end of the age. You see, it wouldn't always be easy for the disciples to have their mission to go and to make disciples in all of the world. That wouldn't always be easy. People would, wouldn't let them speak or they would stop them in their tracks. But he said, I'll be with you always until the very end of the age. One of Jesus' names is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's one of the most comforting aspects about who Jesus is, is that he is God in flesh, and he dwells among people. He gives us everything that we need to live life. In life, we have the people who accompany us in our journey, the fellowship of believers. But we have something even greater than that. We have Jesus, who is Emmanuel, and he walks with us and helps us to do the things that we don't feel like we can do. Because in life, it gets really hard sometimes. We don't feel like we can take another step on our own or that we can do the things that God has called us to do. But we have the people that are around us who carry us when we can. And we have the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And that's something that changes everything. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this day. And I thank you of the promise of Emmanuel, that you sent Jesus to be with us. God, I pray that we would follow the commands that you have given to us to make disciples and tell people about who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
Our scripture this morning is taken from Matthew 28. It is the commissioning of the disciples, the 16th through the 20th verses. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I have prayer requests today and also am thinking of the critical times in our country. We uh, are living in a drought-stricted area. I would request, and many others would too, if you would send us showers of blessing. We have also, or I have also requested and would love for you to be a part of the concerned health for our church family, our community, our state, and it has become a worldwide pandemic. The situation, hopefully the cure for our virus is forthcoming. The pandemic has given great economic stress to people, and businesses, and I would pray that those in charge of making decisions would lean on you in making the tough decisions ahead. Also, Lord, I would pray that the decision makers are in a tough situation, and believe me, the racial injustice that is going on needs help, and I pray that you would be the force in their decision-making. Please, Lord, I praise you and grant you forever. Amen and amen.
Numbers chapter 10 this morning. I appreciate all those who've led us in music and song today and all who've played instruments and sang for us. God bless you and thank you. Numbers chapter 10. The first, the first 28 verses of Numbers chapter 10 uh, are not very inspiring reading. They make for interesting reading, but not inspiring reading. In the first 28 verses... It is the organization of the children of Israel as they move away from the Red Sea toward the Promised Land. He organizes them by tribes, and they all fall behind Moses in these groups of tribes. And he's able to stand on that mountain and look back behind him, and there's a million, million and a half people standing behind him. And you have to wonder if Moses didn't say to himself, who thought this was a good idea? Ambition can take you to position, but ambition will not prepare you for the responsibility that comes with the position. When I was 12 or 15 years old, piling into the Dodge van at First Baptist Church in Slayton, it never crossed my mind the responsibility of the precious cargo in that van. I was always more interested to know if the starter on that Dodge van was ever going to catch and it would start. But when I was 35, and the church at here at Milshoe had a 14-passenger Ford van, and we received a letter from the insurance company that they no longer wanted to insure that van, and they wanted us to sell it. The mere reception of that letter guarantees that that van is worth nothing on trade-in, and it had just a few miles on it. And then 60 Minutes did a story about the danger of 14-passenger Ford vans. Newspaper investigative reports. And then there were Time Magazine had a story on it. And the trouble was that you had a seat that was behind the rear axle. And then the cargo space behind that rear seat, it put too much weight behind the rear axle. And if you simply dropped off the shoulder of a highway, not even onto the turf, but onto the, the, the drop in the sh- from the roadbed to the shoulder, just that slight amount could bring that weight around on that Ford van and cause it to roll. And there was an incredible amount of pressure to stop using these vans. And we communicated back and forth with the insurance company and then the Department of Transportation issued a a ruling. If you would take out the rear seat and not put any cargo behind the third seat, the van seemed to stabilize. If you would take out the seat and not put anything out, the vans seemed to redistribute the weight and they were more stable running down the highway. And the insurance sent us an agreement that if we would do those two things, take out the seat and promise not to put any luggage in, they could continue to insure the van and we could keep the van. It had very few miles on it. So that's what we did. Finance committee signed the agreement. We took out the rear seat and it wasn't very long until we had a group of girls who were going to girls camp down at Florida and it was a weekend camp and everybody was, the sponsor was a mom. And so I took the borrowed Suburban we had, I put the church trailer on it, had it in the parking lot, and then I had the church van sitting out there with instructions, remember, don't put anything in the rear of this van. I left the two vehicles, went to Lubbock to make hospital visits, showed back up that afternoon, and Tanya said, the mamas promised they'd be careful. They had taken the trailer off the Suburban and put all the luggage in the Ford van. The next finance committee meeting, I told the committee, I said, we have to sell the thing. It's obvious that our agreement is not going to work. And if we have an accident in that van, I'm going to take every one of you with me to sit in the living room with the parents when they ask the question. Did you know? And they voted to sell the van. Two years later, I got a phone call from one of the mothers in that group who had been a teacher but was now a principal. And she called and she said, "Uh, I I owe you an apology. I said, for what? And she said, do you remember... 
The time we took the girls to the GA camp and we left the trailer in the church parking lot, I said, I do remember that. And she said, well, I'm a principal now and our school system has two of those 14 passenger Ford vans. And every time we send kids off in those vans, it's almost more than I can bear. She said, I'm going to talk to the school board next week and tell them we need to sell those vans because it is too much. You see, ambition can take you to a position, but ambition will not prepare you for the responsibility that comes with the position. And Moses is standing in front of this column of tribe after tribe after tribe after tribe, and the responsibility and the weight is beginning to fall upon him. And he's beginning to wonder, who thought this was a good idea? Who thought we could keep these people alive in the wilderness? And I want to skip ahead of our text this morning down to verse 33. But in verse 33, Numbers chapter 10, so they set out from the Mount of the Lord three days' journey with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord going before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of the Lord being over them by day when they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he would say, Return to the Lord the ten thousand thousands of Israel. So as they headed out from Mount Sinai toward the promised land, the ark goes before them, and Moses shouts out, Lord, let your enemies be scattered. May they flee before us. And they are led by the ark, and the ark is being led by the cloud, and they're going at the instruction and the direction of the Lord. And then when it comes back to nightfall and the ark returns, Moses shouts out, Return to us, Lord, to our tens and ten thousands. They are being led by the Lord as they make their move north, and it would seem that this divine cloud would perhaps be enough to get Moses through the journey. But in the verse just prior, Moses indicates that he sure would like to have a friend beside him. Reading now from the 28th, 29th verse, Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Now, the grammar is difficult here. You can read that first sentence and you can say, okay, Hobab is Moses' brother-in-law, or you can read the sentence, Mobab, Hobab is Moses' father-in-law. The grammar in the translation I just read to you allows you to reach either conclusion grammatically, and it is unclear in the Hebrew. So whether it's his father-in-law or whether it's his brother-in-law, Hobab is with Moses, and Moses said to him, we're setting out for the place of which the Lord has said, I will give to you. Come with us. We will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I'll go back to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Do not leave us. For you know where we should camp in the wilderness. And you will serve as eyes for us. Moreover, if you go with us, whatever good the Lord does for us, the same we will do for you. So he's being led by the cloud by the day, and the Lord is moving them along, and the ark is following this cloud, and Moses has divine leadership as he goes along. But Hobab, his brother-in-law or his father-in-law, who's grown up in the Midianite desert and knows the place like the back of his hand, says to him, you know, you, you know where we ought to camp. You know where food is. You know where water is. Uh, the Lord's promise good to us. Whatever the Lord does for us, we're going to do for you. Stay with me. Don't leave me. Now, the question is, if Moses is being led by the Spirit of God, why does he need Hobab? So what that Hobab knows the places they should camp and where the water is and where the fuel is? It's just my theory, and it may not hold up, only Moses knows, and he's not here to argue with me. I, I think Moses wanted his company. 
He wanted to be able to stand on a ridge overlooking all those people and talk about the geography with a guy who didn't need anything from him, with a guy who's willing to be his friend, a guy who said, oh, I can go home. I'll be just as happy as at home as I am here doing this. He said, I, you don't need me. He said, no, you stay. James Cook was a, a cowboy, a hunter, a guide, and a, finally a rancher in his latter years. In 1923, Yale University Press published James Cook's recollection of his time. He started out on cattle drives, leaving San Antonio and Corpus Christi, and making his way up the plains to Kansas and on to Nebraska. And in those journeys, he learned the geography of the land. He also learned the geography of New Mexico and Colorado, and he, could, he knew where he was and what was up any point in time. He became a scout for the, Indian, for the Army during the Indian Wars. And in this book, this little book of 1923, he, he laments what's happened to the image of a scout in the movies. The silent movies always portrayed cowboys and scouts as drunkards, and he says you can't be a good scout if you're drinking. He did concede that sometimes the language of the scout was more salty than it should have been, but he gives a rather noble image of a scout. Cook says, a scout's job is to discover danger, give notice to the commanding officer, and in an unknown Land ascertain where water, grass, and fuel can be found. A scout needs to have a strong body and a good eye. Be absolutely honest, resourceful at all times. He had to know well the life of the frontier, both the plains and the mountains. Knowledge of the Indians and their customs, habit, and language was a requirement. The sixth sense that enabled a man to keep his bearings under all kinds of weather both day and night had to be developed. He had to be a keen observer of details. These qualifications supplemented by good common sense and the gift of being able to shoot straight were the necessary nucleus of a good scout's equipment. And he took that template that I just read to you. He took that template for all of those gifts of a scout and he told, it, told some stories about scouts through those eyes. And he talked about how scouts became almost companions to generals and colonels and majors. They were trusted. Even though they were of lower rank, they were brought into that higher company by their trustedness. Moses being led by the cloud of God, but he has this friend in Hobab, this flesh and blood friend who will come along and tell him the story. To have a man who'll sit on the edge of a ridge with you and look out over the plains and say, here's where we need to go. Here's what you need to look out for. Here's where the danger lies. Flesh and blood. We're flesh and blood people. We're people who are comforted by flesh and blood. As Christians, we have a flesh and blood faith. We have what's called in theological terms, we have an incarnational faith. That is, God took on flesh and touched humanity. We have a faith and a flesh that touches one another. You remember the story, it was something like this. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. Joseph went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and expecting a child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. For see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior who is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. He is God in the flesh. And by that God coming in the flesh, it makes our faith kind of an incarnational faith, a touch, a physical faith. It is a faith in which we want company around us. And Jesus came and he said, this is what God is up to. 
And he said, the kingdom of God has come now. Repent and believe. He didn't say you need to take out the newspaper and read the headlines and figure out what God's up to. He said, the kingdom has come now. Believe. He said, and through parables, this is what God is doing in the kingdom, and this is not what God is doing in the kingdom. Hold on and believe the word of God coming in the kingdom of God. Jesus reached out and he touched lepers and he healed them. He touched blind people and they were able to see. He said, this is what God is doing now. God is doing these things through me. God in the flesh. And he took that bread on the last supper and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you in the flesh. And he carried on into Calvary and they hung him on a cross with a sign above his head that said, King of the Jews. This is what God is doing now. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead and he said, this is what God is of the kingdom is here now. He says, you don't have to try to figure it out. You don't have to look for signs in the skies or signs on the horizons or wars or rumors of wars. You don't have to look for rumors of famine or pestilence. This is what God is doing now in the flesh. Believe, repent. It is not our faith is an incarnational faith. God has come to us and Jesus has said, this is what I'm up to. And then in the early church, the Spirit comes upon the church and the church becomes the hands and feet of Jesus that church at Antioch had heard there were famine and persecution of the church at Jerusalem, and they didn't sit around and say, well, let's look and read the newspaper and see whose fault this is. They said, no, there is famine and persecution in our brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem. What are we going to do about it? And they took up an offering, and they bought food. They didn't wait for God to do something. They didn't wait for an answer from God. They didn't wait for some kind of intervention from God. They were the hands and feet of Jesus, and they went and they intervened. In this incarnational faith in which we are given the Spirit of God, we are, through the church, the work of the body of Christ. It is not a theoretical faith where we try to look into the heavens and look into the sky and look into the horizon to see what God's up to. We know what he's up to. Jesus said, I have come that the kingdom may be here. Now, repent and believe. And he did not push it off into some signs and wonders kind of theology that we need to sort this out and figure out what God is up to. No. In the flesh, Jesus came and by the Spirit, we are in the flesh, the hands and feet of Jesus in this time. Last week, Jackie Ray had been living through a pandemic, through economic turmoil, and through racial riots. And she had had her feel. She confessed on her way to work, she listened to too much news and read too much social media. She had a job where she had to smile, be friendly and welcoming and be happy. And she did not feel happy. Her job is to welcome people onto the plane at Southwest Airlines. But early this week, she was in her spot wearing her mask trying to smile through her eyes and welcoming people. Good morning, good to see you. Thanks for flying with us. Glad you're here today. And on the process of boarding, a gentleman came on wearing khakis, a blue shirt, carrying a briefcase, and inside the tucked inside the briefcase was a book that he was reading about racial tensions. She made a note of the title and then noticed where he sat. They were flying from Dallas to Panama City, Florida. After they served the peanuts and the Cokes and picked up all the trash, Jackie Ray went down and saw the gentleman had had the, the book tucked into the, in the seat, in the little pouch right in front of his seat, and he was working on a few things, and she sat down in the chair next to him. She said, is that book any good? He said, I found it to be very helpful for a person like myself. And then they started talking, and she told him her story, and he told her his story. And when I got to the end of the flight, he handed her a note, and then he went back. To, he went to his hotel, and he typed up an email to his entire company. It started out with, I was on a Southwest Airlines flight today. 
and I met a woman named Jackie Ray, and she was the presence of God to me. And he told his story, and he told her story, and he told how God had worked in his life through that conversation. Now, also what makes this interesting is the guy who's typing the email and send it out to his company is Doug Parker. Doug Parker, as you know, is the CEO of American Airlines, riding on a Southwest flight because all the American flights from DFW to Panama City were full and he went and got on a Southwest flight and met Jackie Ray and he said on that flight God met me we worship an incarnational God a God who came in the flesh and by his spirit empowers our flesh that we might be the spirit of God I don't think Moses needed Hobab because he had a cloud that was following, that the ark was following and the people were being led. But I think he needed a physical presence. He needed a friend. He needed somebody to stand beside him and say, here's, here's how this is going to work. We are the presence of God to the people around us. Maybe somebody will write about an email about us and say, I went to the grocery store and God was with me. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And that God in the flesh touched us. And by your spirit, we're enabled to touch others. Lord, help us to listen to your spirit. Help us to slow down. To hear one another's stories. Help us to extend your grace. Help us, Lord, by the power of the Spirit to love one another and to love this community. Lord, we thank you for the gift you've given to us in Jesus Christ, in the presence of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Robert, and all of you who've led us today. It's good to have all of you joining us online. We ask God's blessings upon you, and may you be the presence of Christ in someone's life this coming week. May God bless you, and thank you for joining us at First Baptist Church.